Welcome to Skunk Works, where each episode we speak with CEOs of established SaaS companies about strategies for keeping innovation fresh. Hey, Eric here. I'm the host of the Skunk Works podcast, where we trade stories with experienced business leaders that have proven track records of scaling SaaS businesses. Before we get started, let me just remind you that this episode is brought to you by Half Serious. It's a company that I founded where we work with entrepreneurs to accelerate innovation projects in a Skunk Works format. So my guest today is Brian. Brian, thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much for having me. And the reason I'm super excited about having Brian here is uh, when I was doing the the exploration and kind of looking for guys like you, I wasn't even sure if you guys existed. To me, you're sort of this business myth that exists of CEOs that get brought it, brought in um, by found, founders or founding teams in order to scale their business to the next level. So they get to a point in time, let's call it $2 million, $5 million, and then they're ready for the next jump. And for some reason they decide that they're going to trust a guy like you to, to, to do that. So the, the, one of the reasons I say it's a myth is in my mind, I have no idea what to imagine. Like you hear stories of guys like you, and I've never met one before, so I'm nervous and excited. And in my mind, <laughs> I'm, let me just tell you that what I'm imagining is that the first thing that you do as this new CEO is you, you put your hands up in front of the servers and as like a savant, you're, you, you find, you, you communicate with the product, you understand how it needs to get better, and then you just make these things happen, right? Is that, is that how you work? I, I, I wish. Yeah. I wish it was, uh, yeah, I mean, because, you know, like, you just like, you know, products, right? The minute you develop a feature, it automatically does 10x revenue. Yeah. Right, I'm, right, of yeah, course. right out of the gate. Right? Yeah, of course, right? What, what is that they <laughs> so, call the, um, oh, there's a name for that, the field of dream syndrome. Build it and they will come. <laughs> That's right. You build it and they will come, right? Um, it takes, you know, you got to refine it and right. And you have to, to, it starts off with one vision, one dream and where it ends up, you know, six, nine, 12, 18, two years, three years, five years later is um, quite often very different. You know, the target market you may have launched and you may have done on price. Um, and then you start doing value-based proposition and you find out there's a larger market that's further up and willing to pay a lot more um, than, you know, the target market you had before. But, you know, what I think is interesting about having somebody like me join a team, right, is the very first thing that we do, or I like to do, is I like to start with the customers. And it, it takes, when you come into a, a founding team, the number one thing is everybody looks at you and they're like, all right, we, we think you might be the the personality of the person that's going to be able to help us go from two to 50 million, but we're not sure. Right. And while we don't, well, while I may have been there before you, you have not. Right. And so it, it takes a lot of trust. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of really honest conversation. Um, sometimes a way to think about it is, is usually a, you have two founders or maybe three founders that are running the company and they're getting it to a certain point and the objective of somebody like to me to come in is to be the, the third or the fourth leg in the stool to help operate and fill the gaps and leverage their experience they have a lot of experience that's one thing that a lot of i'll call it uh scaling ceos kind of forget about is you have two founders that have been here from the beginning they've learned a tremendous amount about the customer the product the history, that all matters, not only to them, but also to the customer base. Right. Um, I, I, I want right. to get to, to the relationship with the founders because that's obviously fascinating. But first, I kind of wanted to hear you on, on your approach, right? I, I think yeah. most people would think, well, I need to make something flashy happen in the first 90 days or, or whatever, yeah. but that's that's probably more myth than anything else and, and misconception. So like what... You, you talked about the customer. What do you do once you figure out the customer? What's sure. what are the next steps? No, you're exactly right. So you start with the customer and how they're using the product. Listen to the customer. Talk to the customer. Um, understand what they like, what they don't like. Um, see where maybe they're leading, where they're going to, where are they coming from, right? Who am I winning against? Who am I losing to? And once you start to get a better understanding of the market and how the customer's working together, um, the next step is you got to start to put in place the measurements, the mechanisms to be able to measure. You may not have a formal marketing automation tool. You may not have a, a, a formal CRM in place that 
gives you a full life cycle picture of how a customer behaves or how they're interacting or how they're expanding, what products that they really like. You might have a lot of perceptions based off of um, kind of like what they call the halo effect, right? You release a new feature and a function, all of a sudden somebody buys 50 licenses and it's like, oh, wow, this is the hottest product. But then when you go look at the bigger picture, when you have everything in place, you realize that it didn't really move the needle all that much, although it seemed like it was going to be really great it really didn't change a whole lot in kind of the overall uh, revenue picture, right? At the end of the so, day. So your first step was really to, to understand the, the positioning and, and, and the market. And then and after the that, you're like, well, until I have data, I'm basically bumping around in the dark. I'm going to make changes, but I'm not going to know if they're moving anything at all. So the, your Correct. second step is to say, I need the systems in place that are going to feed me data. Correct. So once you're able to then sit, take the product, customer understand the market now you have the systems that feed you data now you're able to take the data and you're able to look at it and say okay this is how we make money right this is how the money works now we can go back and you can go then to founders and you can say hey look we should do this why well we've got three thousand customers in the last six months that have asked us about this particular feature and function and when you look at our competitors and where they're going this particular feature function when you talk about market share and how we're going to gain market share is actually going to make a difference. And oh, by the way, this new feature and function may give us a springboard to another product or another vertical that we can tuck in or under and add on, not necessarily through acquisition. More often than not, it's through building on top of the existing platform that you're able to actually add an additional module or a different additional piece of uh, functionality over the next 18 months to two years. I mean, if you were to look at this whole process, right, you're talking about First 90 days, there's some low-hanging fruit. You get to, okay, some sales guys need better quota. Maybe you need to hire a sales team. Maybe you need to take a look at a different way in which you're handling leads. Then the, the next 90 days, you're in the first round of been talking to customers now for about six months, right? At the end of that six months, now you're starting to have the systems that are in place to be able to help you measure and be able to take that actionable information from customers, apply it to the measurement of the business, and then start to formulate hypothesis around just simply what it is you think we should start to do next. Then you take the actionable data that comes from the system, start to discuss it as an executive team on a strategy, start to test the strategy. And then when you start making decisions, you start seeing revenue, right? Revenue heals all wounds. Yeah. Revenue starts to come in. And the next thing you know, you're starting to scale and grow and you can see where you can push and pull. And that allows them, the founders to also see that number one, you're, you're being patient with, I mean, they, they may have spent 10 years building this to get to 5 million. They right. may have spent two, right? That's their whole life. It's everything they've done. Their whole life is now sitting in your hands. And your objective is to get that thing to grow from a five-year-old to a college student in five or six years. Right. Right. And so as you start to evolve and as you start to work with the systems and supply the data, they become more comfortable and they trust and verify. And when they look back and they say, Hmm, well, did, did Brian or did Joe or did whoever the person is make recommendations that didn't produce revenue? More often than not, no. Usually we produce revenue. Do we make mistakes? Absolutely. But it's about making the mistake, course correcting quickly, recognizing it, and continuing to evolve it. Right? Nobody likes to burn dev dollars. Nobody likes to burn sales guys without actually reaping the benefits. Um, but or dev capacity, I should say. But at the end of the day, um, you know, the product is what's going to Almost every SaaS company and team that I've, I've joined, the product was what was getting things, is what grew, right? It's how, like every founder's famous uh, word to me is this, every time we hire a developer, we immediately see the incremental increase in revenue after we improve the product. Every time I hire a sales guy, I have no idea what the hell they do, right? <clears throat> so you start to kind of look at them and say, all right, how can we better position the product a little bit more upmarket? I've, uh, that's funny because want? I've... Uh... I've heard the opposite wisdom, yeah. if you will. You know, a lot of times we'll, people will be, well, the, the product is what it is. And people complain, like, it's a kind of a classic uh, scenario that the salespeople are going to be, well, if only I had this feature, I would sell. And then you develop the feature and then it doesn't, it doesn't work. But in the end, um, it's not the product. It's really so, you know, increasing your sales capacity. But you're saying making as a product guy, I want you to be right. I just want to say that making the product better will actually generate this this revenue. But we said at the beginning that a product in a vacuum doesn't really, you know, generate much value. You still need to go to the market with it and stuff like that. That's right. So how you position your marketing 
and how you bring kind of bring the fish in the door. Ah. Your marketing automation tool is going to tell you how to fill all that in. Mm. But let me let me help clarify a little bit around you know if I invest in an R and D resource and I get I can see immediate impact to the business versus if I hire a sales guy, you know what does that mean? Our sales force um, at MSP three hundred and sixty we don't sell features. We don't sell what doesn't already exist today. We'll write down, hey, we didn't win this deal because this particular feature function didn't exist. We might get 50 of those. We have right. 10,000 customers. Did, did you say so we don't sell feature or we don't sell futures? You said- We don't sell futures, futures. So futures. things that don't exist yet, you don't sell things that Correct. don't exist. Yeah, or, or where somebody says, hey, it would be great if you have this and we would say something, oh, well, that's coming. Yeah. Right. When you when you tell a customer that's coming, they may buy based on the fact that that may be coming in the near future, or they may say, "Call me when that comes out." So we sell the current value of the product as it exists today, and we track why we win and why we lose. Got it. And we look at why we lose, and we develop, and we say, the reason why we're losing to our target market might be, uh, we don't have Appleware backup with VMware, for example. Just as yep. a simple, really simple function, and so we look at that and we say, "Wow, we lost five thousand deals out of ten thousand customers because the VMware module doesn't have Appleware backup." So we invest in Appleware backup, and then we see sixty percent growth. But the sales rep is now going back and saying, "Hey, have you taken a look at our new hypervisor backup platform and what it does today?" No, I haven't. Okay, and then they're able to incrementally add on to the existing customer base when we go at go to bat with new customers where we're actually in a dogfight for the first time and that feature comes up, we have that checkbox and the sales team is confident that not only does it work, it works well. It's not something I have to worry about committing to a customer trying to follow up with on the R&D team that's going to be there in the future. They just know that, hey, I'm, this product always works the way it's supposed to work. And we work really hard to make sure that we sell the, the current value of what we do today. Interesting. So you, you got you captured that information from the sales team. Yep. At some exactly. point, you have your own roadmap that this information may influence it or not. Then when those new features come out, marketing makes a big deal out of it. We refresh contacts that said no to us in the past because of these things and trying to win them back. Exactly. Cool. Exactly. Done. Yeah. Another silly way to look at it is if you don't ask the girl at the bar, you don't know if you can ever even play the game, right? Yeah. So what I, what do I mean by that? This is going to kind of contradict a little bit of what I just said. How do you move up market? Mm. You move up market by you go and you try to position your your solution uh, as a as a viable option to a customer that's up market for you. And your goal is to be eighty percent, not a hundred percent. Eighty call it eighty percent Tom Cruise if you're old like me, right? Or eighty percent Brad Pitt or eighty percent whatever. That's your goal. Your goal isn't to be Brad Pitt or Tom Cruise. Your goal is to be eighty percent. Why and, is that? Well, because you're good enough. And is it because it's enough, that last 20% is too expensive? It doesn't matter. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter in the solution more often than not. Okay. Right. Usually with 80% of the functionality at 50% of the cost, you're going to win. 80% mm. of the functionality at 70% of the cost, you're going to win. Got it. And when that additional 20% matters, you'll find out what what it is that you need to do on the product side to incrementally grow that'll take you a little further up market fascinating i i love guys like you that have their their core sort of set of beliefs sort of dialed in and you sort of know what you're doing because you're applying this this way of doing it do you consider yourself a product person or you're like i'm not that good at product i just listen to what the data does and i and they leverage my team or so like today, right at MSP 360, we got two, our two founders are amazing product guys. Got it. Um, and what they do is they li they like, Brian, you're talking to the market all the time. Tell us more and more what you hear. And, okay. um, you know, I work with our product managers. What I, if I were to classify myself as anything, I classify myself as a guy that's here to solve problems. Right. So it's, what is it that we're trying to do? We're trying to grow the business to some, you know, some revenue amount, which is really the goal. Right. What's the objective of the founders? Is it to exit? Is it to just increase it to 50 million and take, you know, have a have a margin at you know 40 percent and continue to take that part down to the business? And uh, is it to be the best product on the planet for that for, for your industry and to continue to accelerate and bubble up other tuck unders, potentially other acquisitions as they go along? Once you have that kind of framework down as to what your goal is going to be, it drives your approach. And then also 
like I don't have all the strengths of product. I don't have all the strengths of sales. I don't have all the strengths of marketing. Another part of our, our job is to sit down and say like, okay, where are my strengths and where are my weaknesses? Who do I need to hire in, right? If, if I show up my first day as the CEO and say, okay, the first thing I need to do is hire a VP of sales and add a quarter million dollars into the run rate of the budget after you just invested in me, I'm not going to be around very long. Right. Why? Because there's a whole lot of sales guys who are already here, probably, or some. There's a lot of you know sales engineers. There's some just process things that need to be addressed. Once we address that and we can get the revenue numbers up, you start to prove that those modifications are, are making sense and, the, and they're actually producing. The end result next would be to then bring in an expert of sales and allow them to continue to take the foundation you put in place, make some minor changes and to get it to grow. Same thing with a VP of marketing. Like at MSP 360, I was here for two and a half years before I hired my first VP of marketing. I worked with the current marketing team in place. We made a lot of minor changes, a lot of some major changes. And then once the foundation was in place, we said, okay, now we're at a point both in revenue and growth. It's time to change the way in which we position ourselves, how we market ourselves, what our go-to-market strategy looks like, the customer base that we're talking to and where we want to go. And we bring somebody in that can focus full time on nothing but marketing rather than having me focus 25% of my time on marketing, 50% on sales, 25% on customer support right. um, and, and services, right? So that's kind of the next piece. And when you start to scale it, right, then that's when the founders in that relationship say, okay, we trust Brian, we trust Joe, we trust John, we trust Ann to come in and hire a VP of sales. And we want to be a part of the interview process. And we want to understand what qualities you're looking for and why. And then when we bring them in, then we start to see the changes. And sometimes they work, they don't work out, right? And the, the, also the role of you know, the CEO that's coming in on board is to recognize, hey, it, we didn't identify something in a culture clash or we didn't identify something up front. That's our failure. And then we have to ask that person to leave and we got to bring in somebody else relatively quickly after that, find another person and, and continue to iterate through. So um, I, I'm trying to reverse engineer your, uh, your framework. And uh, I, had, I had started with market and customer, but now I think that there's a step up, you know, in front of that, which has something to do with the founders, right? You're trying to align with them. You're trying to align with the founders on, on what their intentions are and trying to understand how you, be, how you can complement their style. Because I, I can, I, as a product guy, I think that my, my biggest uh, problem would be that I would step in as another product person and I have two excellent product founders. And now I'm just, you know, I'm just increasing the entropy of the brainstorms instead of, of like being the Correct. integrator and operator that I need to be. So that's, that's very interesting. <clears throat> Correct. I mean, another way to think about it is, is there, everybody's already on a boat and they're already headed down a course, mm -hmm. right? Um, when you join as captain on that boat, if you immediately just hurry up and turn the boat to the right or the left without actually knowing what's in front of you or where you are on earth, you could run right into a, into a rock or an island or land, yeah, yeah. Right? any kind of land. And right? everyone's Another seasick. Boat. Exactly. And everybody's seasick. And then all of a sudden, it's the, the boat gets really, really, really rocky and people start leaving. And who leaves? Good talent. Mm. Right. Then you start having people leave that you don't really want to have leave. And then people become really concerned to say the guy's rocking the boat too much, right? Yeah. Um, versus when you join and you sit in the same room with the founders and they still have the hands on the steering wheel. And your job at that point is to start to take more time coaching and guiding and explaining your methodology and why you're doing what you're doing. And then slowly they start to give you over the wheel and then you can start to steer the ship as you go along. Yeah. I, right? I, Every founder. Sorry. Go no, go ahead. Go ahead. Every founder has their own tolerance. The last company I did this with, um, I joined as a, a finance and ops guy. And um, those founders were very, they were very, very, very fast uh, to adapt and give control when they saw success. They gave you more and more and more. Um, other founders that I've been with, it's taken two years before they say, okay, we're going to take our hands off the wheel. And we're just going to worry about, you know, uh, one, one in particular was just accounting and the other one was all about R&D. So one wanted to be in the mucks of the finance, the other one wanted to be in the product side. So it just, it all depends on the team that you're, you're joining and what they need. Got it. I, I want to pivot a little bit towards that relationship with the founder, but you've already started going down that path. But do you spend a lot of time before the engagement actually even starts um, 
setting up expectations, right? Just to make sure that they understand <laughs> exactly what you're going to start doing. And then what do you do once those, you realize that those expectations work, ex, you know, things are not, things are going well, but not exactly the way that you thought they were. And how do you keep on adjusting those expectations? Yes. Yeah, so um, I think no matter how hard you try, when you're in my position, you try to ask questions like, are you guys really ready? You know, are you really ready to make these changes? Do you want to make these changes in the business? And more often than not, they know they want somebody to come in and help them. So the answer is yes. But, um, you know, it's kind of like, I'm sure everybody remembers the first time they had a Band-Aid torn off when they were a kid. Yeah. Right. Um, they, you ask, right, the nurse or the doctor or mom or dad, you know, is it going to hurt? And they go, a little bit. Right. And then they go just, they're going to go really fast. And they hurry up and tear that Band-Aid off. And then, you know, the next time they put a Band-Aid on, you're like, wait, 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 wait. Like, does it have to come off? Right. Can't we just say, do this flow? Right. Um, and the reason why I use that analogy is because in the beginning, when you introduce a third or fourth person into the founder team, they're going to come with a, not only a fresh set of ideas, which is usually good, but also a little bit of a different way to do things. And how they introduce those methodologies completely determines their success. Right. If they're very abrasive, if they're going to push really hard, if they're going to say, hey, I've got all this experience and that's the only reason why, um, you won't succeed. You know, Doing it just because you did it before doesn't necessarily mean it'll work here. And at the same time, you have to prove that those incremental small changes will make a difference. Yeah. Um, and then at the same time, the founder's tolerance of those changes increases over time. So now you're an adult and you're tearing off the Band-Aid. You know it hurts. You just do it, right? It's things for a quick second and you move yeah. on. Um, and that's really, you know, kind of where you want to be. And that can take a year, take six months, it can take three years. Yeah. It all depends on the team you're working with. Yeah, I'm 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 speaking from a place of experience. So half serious is what a 60 something service company, but I've started other startups before with people or whatever. And 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 one of these companies is called Obi and it's a training platform. And I I put a, a CEO in place who's this, this young woman who's super talented, but I'm having a really, really hard time letting go of the stupidest little ground level decisions. It's very yeah. difficult for me to, to be like, because as soon as something doesn't happen the way that I kind of think it should, even though I don't really have anything to back that up, it's just, I kind of want it to be done this way. And I, right now I really struggle. So I, so, yeah, I mean, good on you if you're like able to, to manage up or a little bit in this way. I don't, I don't know how you do it or maybe I'm the problem. <laughs> well, that, I mean, it's, it, you do get better at managing up. I'm not going to say you don't make mistakes. I mean, I, you know, I've been on the phone with founders recently to say, yeah, I screwed that up. Like we got to, like, that has to be completely different or that's on me. Mm -hmm. you know, hey guys, that's on me, right? That's a, that's a decision that I should have made differently and faster. Um, sometimes you look back and you go, you know, I started too fast. I came out of the gate too fast. How did I, how did I not recognize kind of where we were and did I stress the relationship too much? Um, and that's another part of it too, which is um, in order to grow, it has to be a little pain, but it has to be constructive pain, not, you know, not this uh, negative deconstructive sort of spiraling. You know, you have, the three of you or the four of you have to know each other and trust each other enough that you can push on the relationship and know you're not going to damage it. A, a silly analogy might be a hockey game. I played hockey growing up. Um, right. You know, you could, we would get into a fist fight and then afterwards go for a beer, right? You, you have to be passionate about your role, what it is you're doing. Everybody needs to be doing what's in the best interest of the company and everybody has to know and feel that you're doing what's in the best interest of the company and understanding those consequences. And then afterwards, you have to be able to be both tactful, professional enough, as well as continuing to extend all the branches to be able to go back and go out for beer afterwards. If you put yourself in a situation where you've got the turmoil, but you don't have the growth, then you just went through a whole bunch of emotion for no reason. For no reason. And there's yeah. no benefit to anybody. Yeah. And then at that point, people start asking, like, is this guy or this woman just here to create a lot of pain and I'm not getting anything out of it? And then it becomes just an emotionally uh, detrimental relationship. Right. Yeah. So I'm, I'm guessing that you already understand that you're someone with fairly high emotional intelligence just to be able to 
execute that, right? Because it's completely different ball game if a, a board of director from a publicly traded company had hired you to come in and be the CEO versus you're coming in to a founder team who's extremely emotionally attached to what's going on and you need to somehow take that position of, of CEO nonetheless. Like, they, like, why didn't they just get you in and say you're the COO and you get to run things? But like, why CEO? So what's funny is uh, that's what we did first. Oh, that is what we go. did first. At okay. MSP Nutrition, we came in as a CEO. Uh, I spent uh, four months from January until um, April, basically. And then um, it was announced in uh, May that I, I mean, all along, I knew I would be the CEO, but I knew I also had to spend the next four months just getting and understanding the operations of the business. And I think it's very smart because it doesn't, like it, it, take some pressure off of you, I think, as as mm-hmm. like a publicly facing thing in, in the company as a CEO, everyone's like, all right, that's the new big boss now versus CEO. It's like it lets you kind of do your thing. I think that's that's very smart. But then you have an agreement from the get go that you're going to you're going to, you know, that's the intention for you to move okay. into the to the big chair. Correct. Yeah. And, it, you know, somebody uh, just recently said to me, you know, we could have hired a great CEO like you and immediately turned around and expected a 10x multiple in revenue. Right. Right. And the answer is you can expect that, but that's not realistic, right? The same way if um, if I were to hire a UI UX person and bring them in and say, okay, I would ex- I want to expect a better conversion rate in the product in four months. Right. That's not going to happen either, right? Um, and so having the expectations of what it is that um, that you're expecting to be produced in what point in time, and and I'll even go into a a, a little bit into compensation when you join a team at two and a half to three million dollars uh if you're making more than the founders it's not a good idea mm. it's not a good idea um you should Why? Be because there. it's going to trigger emotions at some point well at some point they know what they're doing mm-hmm. and what they're getting out of it right and they want you to be just as emotionally connected to that business as they are right and we have you know i haven't been there that long yet right maybe i've only been here six months right and so if you're paying that particular executive more than what the founders are getting, generally speaking, um, there's some animosity and resentment that starts to build when the results aren't there. Right. Um, I, I tend to ask when I come to the team, like, hey, let's go up together. Right. Let's start off with one. Of course, there's things like dividend payouts and stuff like that that happen at the board level and happen at the founder level that sometimes the CEO is excluded from and sometimes they're not. There are different bonuses and things like that that are put in place, but you got to remember the executive compensation that the founders are putting in place. Yep. My view is this: all all three should be together. All three should be tied to the same goals. So you're getting all base salary be- plus some sort of equity that vests over a certain amount of years. Yep. Yeah, it should be a base salary equity, and then usually some type of performance bonus based at the end of the year. So you know, let's say for example, if I hit a, if you hit a hundred percent of your, um, of your board target. Let's mm-hmm. say you hit 100% of your board target. Let's say you get you know, $50,000, just to make a number simple. And then if you hit 150% of your board target, but you double the cash that goes into the business, well, you get 100000 Well, that makes sense, especially if at the end of the day, the founders on the board side decide to take a dividend at a quarter million each. Got right? My, my result produced an extra quarter million or half a million dollars in cash in the bank that wasn't necessarily there before mm-hmm. that personally benefits, right? It's, it's value that I've brought to the organization. I mean, you guys don't start businesses just because yes, you want to change the world, but at the end of the day, if you're not making any money at it, it's not going to survive for very yeah. long. Right. Yeah. yeah. And your quality of life goes up as I perform. And that's a part of it as well. And that kind of alignment means that the alignment is the same, especially if you have like, sometimes you have advisory board members that sit on the side. Right. You might have two guys that found that they have one or two advisory board members that they're paying a small subset of money and the CEO sitting there with all four of them. Right. Maybe. And uh, and they're like going, all right. So from an advisory perspective, I'm expecting, you know, twenty thousand dollars a year in dividends uh, for just, you know, produ- participating as a as an active play, you know, an active board member mm-hmm. in the or um, in the company. Um, they want to see the same thing, but they also those advisory board members want to make sure that the three people are aligned the right way. So if the compensation is the same and everything's working with what's funny is, is I'm okay. Me personally, I'm okay with the founders even having a higher base and a higher variable 
than I am until I've proven myself. And I'll even right. say that from the, hey, when I prove myself, can I, can we talk about where my comp level should be relative right. to where yours are? But I'm not okay with the opposite. I will yeah. just. Yeah. So what you're saying is basically you're the CEO. So base and, and bonus should, should be reflective of that. And then anything else that has to do with risk taking and equity, you know, makes sense that, that the founders would yeah. be, you know, so, but it's, Correct. they're taking, they're taking on more risk. Brian, right. I, I went 15 minutes over time because it's so oh. interesting. Uh, but I want to wrap this up uh, and, and I, I want to try to pull in on an innovation thread because that's one of the themes that we try to cover. And so the way that I think I want to explain this is that the your, your approach as a sort of scale CEO is to come in, connect with the founders, then figure out market and customers. Then you get into to making sure that you have the data. And then only do you really start considering innovation as a serious topic because now the data is coming in with the, the qualitative feedback from salespeople. You can start combining that with the roadmap and, and figure out what makes sense in terms of innovation. Innovation feeds marketing. Marketing then you know um, informs sales to be able to, to catch up uh, people that, that have said no because of these reasons, but also to go after new markets and move up market. So that's, you that's got what it. I'm getting from all of this. So you got it. Th thank you so much, Brian. I kind of want to ask you, like, what do you read? Because it's uh, it sounds like you have a lot of of information, like, like reading things that I should consider or podcasts or, you know, whatever. Uh, well, so there's the lean startup, right? Eric Rice, always, right. always a good one. Mm -hmm. uh, Rhythm, which is about executive meetings that are always uh, solving problems. Oh, I've and never. Then, uh, and then, yeah, Rhythm is actually a, a great methodology. If you get a chance, check that out. Okay. But um, one of the other ones that I like, and I actually reference uh, sometimes, it's going to sound a little crazy, is something called Unbeatable Mind. And, okay. uh, and, you know, that help you at 20 extra performance, spend more time with your family and, and also, uh, your passions and, uh, be able to profit from those as well. So, um, those are three great books that I enjoy. And as well as the, you know, all the fun things, the soccer and football and lacrosse and everything else, my family does. So that's all good. Very cool. Brian, thanks. Thank you again for your generosity and your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you for yours. Have a great afternoon. Have a great time. everybody. You too. Cheers. Thanks for listening to Skunk Works. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.